my name is Bob Sternberg, and I'm a professor of human development at Cornell. Well, uh, I became interested in psychology when I was in elementary school and felt that that was what I wanted to do. As a, uh, in my case, as a result of not doing well on IQ tests and wanting to figure out why I did so poorly on IQ tests. So for much of my career, I focused exclusively, almost exclusively on intelligence. And then I began to feel like intelligence wasn't the whole story and that uh, there are people who are smart but not very creative. So I started studying creativity because I felt that people who were lacking in creativity often got promoted into positions of power and influence on the basis of SATs and ACTs and GREs and GMATs and they weren't the right people for the jobs. And then I started studying common sense because I concluded there were people who were analytically smart and creative but didn't have much common sense. And then I started studying wisdom because I felt that wisdom went beyond common sense and creativity and intelligence. So, and I also study love and hate and teaching and learning and things like that. Uh, my biggest contribution in studying wisdom is I think that my children are pretty wise. I have two adult children, and uh, they've grown up to be pretty wise, and I hope to save for a three-year-old triplets. My second biggest contribution is probably, and it's not a very big contribution, I would say it's uh, small to medium small, is the balance theory of wisdom. Yeah, so I got interested in wisdom because I saw people who were smart doing foolish things. And I even edited a book on why smart people can be so stupid. And the conclusion I reached is that people can be really smart uh, in an analytic sense, an SAT sense, and it can actually interfere with their being wise because they figure they're so smart they can't do dumb or foolish things. And I saw them when I thought making mistakes. Uh, people are very smart in positions of power who either become overly optimistic that if it's my judgment it must be right or egocentric, it's all about me or falsely omniscient, uh, I think I know everything, I'm so smart, or falsely omnipotent, believing they're all powerful, uh, or falsely invulnerable, thinking they're like Superman, they're so smart that they can get away with whatever they want. Um, and in some cases, becoming ethically disengaged, feeling like ethics are really important for other people, but they've risen above that. So, so I realized that, you know, here were all these smart people, and when I looked at, I study leadership too, and teach a course on leadership, and when I looked at leadership failure, most of the people who were smart were, shall we say, overly susceptible to doing foolish things. So the balance theory basically was about that. It was that it's applying your abilities and your knowledge and your passions for a common good by looking out for your own interests but also other people's interests and higher order interests which could be your state your community your country uh, the world god something higher than yourself uh, by taking into account both the short term and the long term. It's not just doing what is good for others today or tomorrow, but what's good in the long term uh, through the infusion of positive ethical values. 
that what you're doing is ethical is, and that's part of its being wise. And all that is done to adapt to environments, to make yourself a better fit, to shape environments, uh, to make the environments better fit to you or to find new environments to work in. The uh, principles of wisdom that I outline, whether they're mine or someone else's, I don't think mine are privileged over other people's. Uh, I don't think the difficulty is incorporating them into a school in the abstract. It's that there are contextual difficulties. I, I like to have music in the background <laughs> because it, it enhances what I say. <laughs> also blocks it out in case it's too foolish. Um, the, but there are a few problems. One is standardized testing, which doesn't assess wisdom particularly. So there isn't much incentive for teachers to stress wisdom if that's not the way they're going to be evaluated, or the kids are going to be evaluated, or the school's going to be evaluated. Uh, a second problem is, as we've discovered in our own work, they never were trained in how to teach for wisdom. So it it's not easy for them because that's not what they learned how to do. A third problem is that it's not something necessarily that school systems and parents are going to support. I mean, they may feel like, you know, it's hard enough for kids to learn the facts, what's all this wisdom stuff. and. You know, for some people, it would sound ideologically motivated, even though it isn't, but, you know, like some kind of leftist plot or something. So that's a third problem. And I think a fourth problem is ensuring that it's fully integrated into the curriculum rather than, well, now we're going to do our wisdom exercise or today's wisdom day. It really has to be part and parcel of the whole thing rather than sort of separate it into here's here's the wisdom exercises. So I think it could be done, but there are challenges. Yeah, I have, uh, I didn't follow them because in 2005, I went into administration for, spent eight and a half years doing that. And I had an agenda that included teaching for wisdom in college. So that was part of my administrative agenda. And another part of it was incorporating wisdom-based questions into admissions devices for undergraduate. So when I was Dean of Arts and Sciences at Tufts, we created a project called Kaleidoscope, which supplemented tests like the SAT and the ACT with measures that assessed creative, analytical, practical, and wise thinking. And then when I became provost at Oklahoma State, we had a project called Panorama, which did something similar. And it was based on research I'd done when I was a professor at Yale. So, so I know it can be done uh, if there is top-down and bottom-up support for doing it. Oh, I think, you know, I was just listening to an interview on the BBC while I was driving to work today. Uh, and in the interview, an interviewer is asking about front trading. It's when you have a trade to make for a client that you do some trading in advance so you get a better price and they get a worse price. And the interviewer asked the front trader whose voice was disguised, uh, did you have ethical concerns about this? And the trader and others who were interviewed said that ethics just isn't a very big part of what we do in our investment bank. And that, I thought, is a problem with much of our society, that 
you know, ethics is sort of, remember when I talked about ethical disengagement, it's for other people. And what I try to teach my own kids is that it's not only for other people, it's for you. And it's not just for ethics class or religious services or Sunday school. Uh, it's something you uh, should incorporate into your know, everyday life all the time. <clears throat> I first became interested in wisdom in part because I had a graduate student who I gave really a bad advice to when I was, I was probably in about my fourth year as an assistant professor, so it was roughly in the 19, early 1920s. And um, she had two job offers, <clears throat> one from a, primarily a teaching institution and one from a very prestigious research institution. And she asked which job she should take. I said, well, you know, if you don't take the offer from the more prestigious institution, you'll always wonder how you would have done if you'd gone there. And the problem with that is that her penchant was really for teaching. And I was doing what seemed right at the time when I was maybe 28, 29, but it was really bad advice. And so what I have encouraged my kids to do is don't go for the prestige of the money, go for the fit. Find the place that is the right place for you, and you're the right place for them, and that's where you'll have the best life. And that applies <clears throat> as well to my own life. I've had several jobs at universities. I've worked at Yale and Tufts and Oklahoma State and University of Wyoming and Dale Cornell. And you know, all but one were pretty good fit. And what I came to realize is that, you know, I talked about it with the importance of adaptation, shaping, and selection. When it's the wrong environment and you can't shape it, get out. And that's true whether it's a job or an interpersonal relationship. Uh, doesn't work for your kids. <laughs> but uh, so I think you role model it for your children. And you teach them that these are important principles, looking out for others, not just for yourself, looking out for the long term, not just what makes you happy today, uh, balancing your own and others' interests with larger interests. Those are important things to do every day. Well, it's easy to see the detriments. Uh, for one thing, it's really fast. And none of us always comes with, up with our best things to say really quickly. And often when you read emails, people say things that had they written a letter or thought it through for a while, they probably never would have said them. So I think the speed, uh, and especially for teenagers and pre-teenagers when they tend to be at a stage of life where they're fairly impulsive anyway, raging hormones and all that, uh, that is a challenge. Uh, a second challenge is that, you know, and I was the same way, teenagers don't think about the long term all that much. Uh, they're worried about what their friends think about them today and tomorrow and yesterday, but you know, they're never going to grow old. <laughs> and so it, people put things into emails that, or into Instagram or whatever it is that they are going to often regret later. It is, uh, they trust in privacy screens and uh, filtering that often don't work. Uh, almost any of those barriers can be sabotaged or penetrated or whatever. So I think the second thing is that it makes public things that before wouldn't have been that can stay with you for your whole life. Uh, Google now has been forced to remove information in Europe by some laws, but here, you know, you, you put that picture on and it's there. And you may think it's private, but it isn't what it is other people get a hold of it who you didn't intend to get a hold of it. So I think that's the second challenge. A third challenge is that 
And the internet kind of encourages shallow thinking. Uh, and, you know, not just the kids, it does. Uh, I find it harder to read a book than I used to, and I talk to a lot of other people who have found the same thing. It, it uh, you know, it's just like when you exercise, uh, I do weights, so I exercise certain muscles that get stronger. Well, the internet sort of exercises certain mental muscles, which are the ones that, you know, you're time sharing and you're going back and forth. And people like to think they're good at that, but most of us aren't particularly good. Their performance suffers. So it leaves us often thinking in a shower way. And, uh, and what I sometimes see in students is that they fail sufficiently to check the credibility of information they get on the internet. They think if it's online, it must be true. So those are some ways that I think it's not particularly helpful. Uh, where it can be helpful is that it gives you access to ideas and information that in the past you could never get. Uh, it gives you access to different cultural practices that in the past, you know, it's still better to visit the place, but you can learn things about other cultures in a way that wouldn't have been possible before. Uh, it, it can expose you to multiple points of view, which is important for wisdom. Uh, sort of dialectical thinking, understanding different perspectives on the same phenomenon, and that's important. But that also depends on how you use it. If you're always listening to Fox News and Rush Limbaugh, or you're always listening to uh, Rachel Maddow and uh, MSNBC, or whatever, you know, whatever your preferences are, then you can end up getting no more diversity of information on the internet than you'd get if you read newspapers. So it's uh, like so many things in life, a mixed blessing there. It's one of those things that has good sides and bad. Well, first of all, I think that what's important is not experience, but what you learn from it. Um, they're people who have a lot of experience, but they don't learn much from it, and they keep making the same dumb mistakes. Uh, I think that the experience that has had the possibly the most influence in my life was that when I was in elementary school, I did poorly on IQ tests, as I mentioned before. Uh, I like to think because of test anxiety, although I realize there are alternative explanations. And as a result of doing poorly on the test, my teachers thought I was stupid. Uh, I, I thought I was stupid. Uh, I did stupid work. They were happy I did stupid work because people are happy when you give them what they expect. I was happy that they were happy and everyone was pretty happy. So it was a nice, happy group. Uh, and then in fourth grade, I had a teacher who thought there's more to a person than an IQ test score. She had high expectations for me. Uh, and I went from being a mediocre student to being an A student. So I think for me, and that experience affected my whole life and my research career, we often inadvertently set up self-fulfilling prophecies for others, but also for ourselves. And we don't realize the extent to which we make them come true. Uh, and I've seen it in my own life. I, I've always thought I'm pretty bad at spatial kinds of things. I don't visualize well. And so I had trouble following directions. But once when I was in an inner city at night and I had to get out of it or really put myself at risk, I got out fine. And I realized that because I'd always thought I was bad at spatial relations, I never really listened to reactions. I always got lost. And it always became a confirmation of a belief about myself, which wasn't that accurate. So that was powerful. If you expect a lot from people and you nurture their strengths, you get a whole lot more than if you, whether consciously or unconsciously, write them off as losers. And they often become losers, and that not only means other people, that means you yourself.